Hello, welcome to the Pursuit of Excellence with me, Anthony Bayruti. Need your help real quick. If you like the videos, hit the thumbs up button right below and please subscribe to get access to our latest interviews. Hit the subscribe button right there. Also, we'd love to hear from you about our interviews. In the comment section, tell us who you want us to interview or what you thought about the whole thing. Without further ado, enjoy the interview. All right, I'm very excited. Today's a special one. We're joined by Joey Haywood, a.k.a. King Handles. Thank you very much for joining us, Joey. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So uh, let's, let's go to the very beginning real quick. Where did you grow up and how did basketball get started in your life? Uh, I grew up in uh, Vancouver, B.C. I'm locally uh, here, and, but uh, also my parents are from Trinidad and Tobago, so my parents used to t take me back and forth uh, from here to Trinidad, so I spent like three, four months out of the year go uh, during carnival season. So my dad has a little carnival thing down there. So a little business down there. So he just used to bring me there a lot. So I basically grew up here and uh, here in Trinidad uh, during my younger, younger years. But uh, when I grew up, I never used to like basketball. I used to like uh, floor hockey. So I used to play a lot of hockey. And then uh, we, we used to actually live uh, First Avenue. So I used to go to Britannic Community Center quite often. I used to play floor hockey, but my brother played ball. And uh, he used to play on the other side of the court. And um, he's like, oh, come shoot some hoops. I'm like, no, nah, I hate the sport. I hate it. I don't like, I just want to play hockey. And um, and actually, we ended up moving to uh, Granville, Granville and 70th. And it wasn't really a community center really close by there. The closest one was like Marple. But it was still kind of far for me for the, to walk. So um, and I used to like video games a lot. So my brother kind of like, you know, kind of forced me to say, listen, like, I'll rent you a video game if you beat me one-on-one. -on -one. And I actually beat my brother one-on-one -on -one, one time. But it took me a while, though, maybe like a month or two. And uh, finally beat him. And, you know, after that, I fell in love with the sport. I, and I got my video game as well, too, as well. So it was good. <laughs> so, Donald Combo, do you remember what the video game was? No, I can't remember. <laughs> I, I, I actually, you know what? I think it was like Techno Bowl, I think. Oh, you know, yeah. That, Techno Bowl. Game. Good stuff. That game. Kids nowadays, they don't understand what it was like back in the day playing video games. It's not quite the same thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah um, okay, so you, you started to fall in love with it. How old are you at this point? Uh, I was at seven, six, seven years old. Oh, wow. Okay. So young. Okay. So that's fantastic. And so yeah. you're getting going. What, what, what high school do you end up going to and how does your game start to come together? Oh man. I went to, so I went to, uh, David, uh, David Joel elementary school was like, like, like a 10 minute walk. And then after that, uh, graduated from the elementary and went to a transfer over to McGee secondary. So, I was on the I was I was on the uh, McGee secondary side, but the closest school was Churchill too as well. So a lot of my friends went to Churchill, and very few of my friends went to uh, McGee. But I ended up going to McGee because I was on that side, and yeah. So actually, how I really got better is really watching like my brother play growing up playing with my brother, and my brother used to always take me everywhere, all the outdoor courts, Kitsilano, Bonzer, like almost everywhere um and to play ball so i used to always watch my brother too but also i used to watch like michael jordan um during during that time too magic johnson but i really fell in love with michael jordan when he actually won his first championship and i was like you know what that's where i want to be and that's where i want want to be like like michael jordan because he just brought a different player to the game and just not that just like people are just loving him the crowd just going crazy just whatever he does like man this guy's like uh, an amazing athlete, but just how the people just like fell in love with him with his play, right? And his personality. So I was like, man, I want to look up to this guy. So my goal was to make the NBA my goal, right? So um, yeah, that's how. And then after that, and when I was in grade eight, grade nine ish, uh, I kind of watched the annual mixtape tour. So I saw that, skipped my Lou, the annual mixtapes. And I was like, man, like going from watching like Al Iverson from my journey. Allen Iverson, Kobe, to, like, watching the animal mixes, like, man, basketball, you could do a lot with basketball. Like, you don't have to go to the pro route, right? You could always, like, play street ball and just travel around the world. So when I saw that, I was like, man, like, that's what I want to be, like, skip to my Lou. But skip to my Lou was in the NBA during that time. So I was like, man, this guy could switch his game up from – doing street ball and to play organized. I was like, man, I thought that was like the coolest thing in history. So I try to, you know, develop my game just like Skip to my Lou during that time in my high school years. Imagine what he would have done if there was social media back then. I mean, oh. I mean he was huge. And people don't really, I mean, like, again, the kids these days, nobody's got any idea what the hell a, a, a VHS recording is or a DVD. The mixtape was unbelievable. I still remember that. I mean, yeah. 
it was just you 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 got to see cool stuff and nobody's really duplicated it uh since then to that level like it was kind of like everybody knew about it it was a big deal back then and so that's yeah. interesting you got to see that you got to see skip I remember when he made the raptors that was a big deal oh um, you get to see him play like actually in canada and watching the games on like tsn or you know sportsnet like man that's the guy that I looked up to, I get to watch him play all the time because before that he used to play with Milwaukee, but he didn't really do like, I guess, cause the street ball was kind of hard for him to, you know, to, to play that organized game. But then I, he just found it. He just found all of a sudden, but he, he just like, he, he was just super patient, you know, super patient, believed in the skill and he just got the opportunity. I think someone got hurt or something like that. They needed somebody to a yeah. point guard yeah. in Milwaukee, and then he just stepped his game up and it was a sky's the limit uh, for him. Nope. So let's talk, let's talk about your high school career. So how, how does your high school career go? Obviously, I'm assuming you're a gym rat. You, 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 you were in the gym all the time. All the time. What does that mean, though? Give me, give me a breakdown of what it, to, to, to your level of gym rat. You're too skilled. So for, for the skill level that you have, it had to have taken an extraordinary amount of time. What are, yes. we, what are we talking about? I mean, okay, so during high school, so when you get high, <laughs> when you hit high school, uh, you know, there's distractions along the way, right? There's, you know, eight, your grade eight, grade nine, high school years, you got, you know, friends, want to go partying, want to go out, want to hang out. You got, you know, you start liking girls, crushes, not just that, school dances, right? You got the, they got the Halloween dance, you got <laughs> your Christmas dance, you know? They don't even have dances anymore. But anyway, <laughs> it was a big deal. It was a really big deal. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. So uh, it, it, it's, it's basically sacrificing, right? Sa I, I never went. I can tell you right now, I only been to one school dance. And I think it was in grade nine, grade 10. I was forced to go. And my friends said, come on, go, go, man. And the girl kind of, I, I kind of liked a little bit, right? Uh, uh, kind of like I had a little, uh, crushes there, right? So I wanted to go see them. And you know what? That was the worst dance dance I ever been to. I was so bored because I was thinking the whole time was like, man, like I should be in the gym. Why am I wasting my time here? Because before that, I'm just working on my game like all the time. So like go back to what you're saying is like, you know, you're going to have people that are going to not, I don't know, distract you, but want you to do things that are, kid things right like growing up in high school like going out going to eat you know uh dances um going to watch a movie i never did any of that really i didn't do any of that i would go play ball with my brother and after school i'm on the uh, back on the basketball court again during lunchtime uh, um, i'm eating my food quickly and, and i'm back working on my game or playing with the guys right and then right after school right after that I'm working on my game. So you have to have that commitment. You know, if you really love something, you really believe in something, and you think you can go far with it, you will do whatever it takes to be the best athlete or best doctor or whatever you want to be. So it takes a lot of sacrifice. And, and you know, and, um, yeah, I didn't do – you could say I was a basketball junkie, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? I'll, I'll tell you this. Uh, there's a lot more options for kids nowadays. And – you know, uh, people tell me, oh, kids are stupid. Kids, are, they don't know this. They don't, and I'm like, no, I think kids are smarter than they've ever been, to be honest with you. I think so. I think they can, they can, uh, they can spot a fugazi faster, yeah. right? They know if you're fake or if you're real. As yeah. a coach, they can tell right away. Whereas yes. before, we used to just listen. We didn't really, we didn't know any better. Yeah. They also know, hey, wait a second, this isn't that fun. Why am I doing this? I can go play Xbox or I can go do Instagram or I can, so, it has to be captivating, but I'll, I'll say this though, the people that are willing to put in the time and sacrifice that you're talking about, looking back at it, ever, ever a time where, you, you know, you obviously have to sacrifice a lot of things, ever a time where you look back and you say, you know, I probably shouldn't have done all that basketball. I, I, I would have been better off if I had done blah, whatever, X. Yeah. Well, I look back and you, that's a good question. And, 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 and I look back and I sometimes, some of them think maybe, you know, if I, if I, I think if I, if I look back, like I look back, I think I should have maybe had a little bit of fun, just a little tiny bit, like a little percentage, you know, go out with my friends a little bit more. But at the same time, if I did that, I don't think I would have been where I'm at today. 
right? So like you said, it's, it's a sacrifice. So I got to live with it. I didn't really have much, people might think I might not have much of a life, you know, because I played so much ball and I didn't go out. But you know what? That's a sacrifice I took and I, I, I could live with that, right? And I'm not mad because I'm able to like, you know, travel the world and impact people all through social media and show the things what, I, what I've done. But it, like you said, it takes sacrifice, right? So yeah, just a little bit, you know, little something, a little fun, but uh, end of the day, no, I'm, I'm happy at the decision I made. You know what? And I think that's, I think that's something that, you know, young kids, I'm going to, I'm going to force a lot of young kids to watch this video, to be honest with you. And I think that's something that I think a lot of them need to take is that, you know, the work may be hard and it may be a lot, but you never look back at it and say, I wish I didn't do it. And so, yeah. you know, uh, that level of focus is, is what's necessary. And so talk about how your high school, uh, your senior season went, how did that go? What was it like? What were your goals at that time? And how, yeah. what, what happened after that? Ah, uh, yeah, so uh, great. So senior season, grade 11, grade 12, um, I, my game was getting a lot better. Uh, I was went from five, I think five, four, five, six to in grade 11 to a summer, I grouped up to five, 11. So I had a pretty major growth spurt, right? And um, I remember going to New York, actually grade 11, and actually going to go visit my auntie during that time, uh, going to grade 12, that grade 12 year. That summer, I spent two, three months in New York, and I just worked on my game. This worked, and I played ball, pick up ball down there too. And when I got back, I got, I was a lot, I was a lot better because I'm playing against guys that could play basketball, like older guys, street guys. And it wasn't easy, right? But that's why I learned. And I remember, remember, I was out, out, outside playing for seven, working on my game for like six, seven hours. I was there all day. That's where you see me. After that, I go grab a pizza, you know, a New York pizza, and I'm back again on the court, right? Like, and I'll go, yeah. And I didn't really go because my family lived in Staten Island. I didn't really go to Harlem or Bronx and all like that. I kind of stayed where I was because my, during that time, it's pretty, you know, my, my parents were pretty strict. They didn't want me to go a whole lot of <laughs> weird places in New York, right? So I kind of stuck with, stuck with the area I was and then I got back to Vancouver grade 12 year I had a good year um I remember the beginning of the season I averaged I think about 17 points a game about 20 and then that was the year 2001 2000, that was 2002 was a was actually the school lockout they had a lockout so a lot of schools I uh, couldn't play ball so McGee was actually one of the schools that that was actually run up and going. It was McGee, I think Kate Solano, Prince of Wales. There weren't that many schools the second half. And I went from averaging 17, 20 points to averaging well, almost 30 points a game. So my game was getting a lot better. I was developing a jump shot during that time. During the time in high school, uh, I didn't really have a jump shot. I had really good handles, but uh, I didn't really have a jump shot. And I actually ended up uh, working on my jump shot a lot. And that was with uh, uh, Doug Eberhardt, right? No, Paul, Paul Eberhardt's brother. No. The guy that coaches the Langara, I always get them mixed up, man. The Langara's Paul, Doug is his brother. Doug is his brother. Yeah, Doug, exactly, exactly. So he uh, actually helped me out with my shot um, a, a lot, actually, during, during my high school. Uh, high school, And he was assistant coach, too, as well at, uh, at, at McGee Secondary. So, And I remember that year we played we played against Kitsilano. That was with Levon Kendall, Chris Porteous. That was a Paras team. And... Um, and we were with them in the first quarter. We were we didn't really have uh, a good uh, that good of a team. We had guys that worked very hard, but talent wise, you know, it was only one or two of us. But the other guys worked hard. We ended up actually, I think, we're being up. I think we tied the game first quarter, or we we're up by six first quarter. But after that, they killed us. But I remember that game. I had like thirty five points against those guys. So when I knew I had thirty, I can score against those guys. I was like, you know what? I can take my game to the next level. And but I was trying to go play. In, in the United States during that time, but my SHC, SAT scores weren't high enough, right? It was pretty pretty bad. So I ended up getting recruited by Langara and Capilano. Um, I ended up going actually Langara right after right after uh, high school. And I only did, I only played there for one semester and that's it because, you know, I wasn't really a school guy. I didn't, you know, all I did was play basketball. I didn't really, I barely passed high school because um, and, 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 I never really studied as hard. Uh, I just, you know, studied enough, you know, had people to help me out during that time too as well. Cause I know it was kind of hard for me learning a little bit, concentrating. Uh, so I had a, they said I had a learning disability. So um, yeah, so that, that, that was my year. I dropped out. And after that, I just 
did street basketball. We had a little street ball team during during my high school years from grade 10 to about, you know, grade 12 and a little bit after that. So I uh, ended up been doing, doing a lot of playing a lot of hoop it ups and building a name for my street ball name for myself in the city and around the world. And I remember uh, actually traveling. My first game was in Albany, New York in the age of right after Langara, actually. A uh, year right after, I played against a uh, bone collector, a lot of a lot of M one guys. So after that, I knew what I could do, and I, you know, since then I've been traveling the world, playing playing street ball. So how's the name King Handles come from? Where's that? Where you got that? That's that's a great name. If I I'm the venue, they call me the Venue King. Okay. I know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so what? Well, your name is so much cooler though. What, how do you get King Handles? How's that happen? Oh, so I was playing at Bonds, Bonds and Recreation Complex, which is in Burnaby, and I, and uh, you know, I, I, I was playing in the game. Then I crossed the guy up so bad, and one of my friends actually, and a good friend of mine, is like, "Yo, that's King Handles right there," and it just stuck with me since I was like 13, 14 years old, and I just never, yeah, that's how it started. That was your nickname in high school. Yeah, in high school too. Yeah, all through high school, man. King Handles, man. <laughs> That's a heck of a nickname to have in high school. You must have been real cool with that nickname. Oh, hey, man. Uh, you know what, though? I, I never thought anything about it. Like, they, they called me that. But for me, at the same time, I wasn't like, yeah, King. Okay. I was like, you know what? I still got to work on my game. One, I have the name King Handles, so I still got to keep – I still, I got to live in the gym, all right? I got to gotta keep that name because I don't want I don't want anybody to come say and come see me play, play against me, and then all of a sudden I'm losing the ball and stuff like that. So I think that also – help me work even even harder to even have that name too as well so that, that's a huge point because i think a lot of people shy away from pressure but you're saying even something as simple as a nickname created the pressure for you to put in more work and i think yeah. a lot of people need to appreciate that like pressure doesn't need to be a negative thing it can be something that gets you excited to to, to take it to the next level oh for real for sure for sure yeah so now you you start traveling how does that happen who tells you you got to go to new york or how do you where are you, what, 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 what's getting this thing going? How are you, you go, I know you go international. I know you're going to Europe. What, what's, what's, I mean, what a, what a, it's a big difference between McGee and you know, <laughs> out here yeah. where we're going. Well, how's that happen? Yeah, especially at, at, at an age, at a young age like that, traveling, right? Like, so it actually started off in, I think, grade 11 or grade 12. I can't remember the time frame. I think 99, 2000 ish, probably a little bit later than that. Um, it all started through watching that one mixtape, Skip to My Lou, and trying to emulate him, right? The whole emulate him and emulate the players around him, right? Like Hot Sauce, Future. Because after, after volume, volume one, there was volume two, three, four, five, and it just kicked. I was like, man, no, this you can't do that with the basketball. You can't. Are you serious? So I'm seeing that. I'm working on my game. So, so Hoop It Up came, Hoop It Up, three on three, came to uh, Vancouver. Um, and so I played in it the first the first two, three years. But when after I saw the M1 mixtape, I started getting a little better at my skill and a little more confident. And I remember the third year they had Hoop, up, Hoop It Up, maybe the fourth year, I remember playing in the morning game. It was like a 9 a.m., 9.30 a.m. game or 10. I remember it was super early. And... So we're playing again. So we get we got to go to this court. So we get there. I got my crew, and um, and I remember there was a game right the right next to us. There's another game there. So we start playing the game before that was they're they're already playing. And all of a sudden we get on the court. We check up the ball. All of a sudden we start doing tricks, and you just see the crowd. It was like nobody watching us. To like slowly, people start coming. And all of a sudden, it got so crowded that the other team that was playing, the other teams that are playing in the other court, people were taking over that court. One wasn't even looking at that game. And I was like, what? This is crazy. And now security started coming to that game, too, because people were coming on the court. The, the guys couldn't even play. They're like, what the hell's going on? We're trying to play. What, you know? So that's where it all actually started was hoop it up. Then all of a sudden, after that game, they had two guys that were recording that game said, hey, listen, we're, doing, we're about to do this, this kind of like an Anwan mixtape, but we're going to call it, we're, we're, we're working on this project, just like the Anwan mix, but we want to do it locally. Would you like to be part of it? So hearing that, I'm like, man, for sure. Like, I'm not even thinking anything, right? Like, let's do it. So 
the first tape called came out was called Anodic. So it was my crew, and also I had a, I knew another guys that played street ball too as well, and they had their crew. But so we came together. We called called it the Nautic, and it came out Nautic One, and it went viral on the internet, like underground street ball mixtape. Like there, people are saying this is better than One. So that was the same year that YouTube was out, but it was baby. YouTube was a baby. But all that well, Nautic One got one on YouTube, then and it got bigger. It's like people are like talking about this. Like man, I think we should do a second one because we have way we could do way better. So then after that, we went to the Hoop It Up again the next year and crushed it. And the crowd got even bigger, like bigger. Like it was so crazy that the second year when we were about to make the Nautic 2 that people knew before us when, where, what court we were going to play. It was like already packed. And being like 17, 18 years old seeing that, was like, are you serious? Like, this is unreal. We're like, kind of like, and one of Vancouver or Canada. So that's how it all started, and that's how, and and, and that's how that's how I got to travel around the world because through the internet, through YouTube, right? Through all these LimeWire people downloading the Nautic, you know, they buy it, they download it, you know. <laughs> wow, that's from awesome the past here, man. LimeWire, is this on YouTube? Not it. Can I go on YouTube right now? Yeah. Watch it, yeah. You can watch Nautic one and two, yeah. How do I spell Nautic? Uh, the so T H E and the Nautic N O T I C. Here we go. Yeah. So oh, this looks. So great. Yeah, if you have a time. If you have time, you can watch both both of them. There, there. I know some of the sites, some of the the searches, you see some like two part two part three, but you go check it out and check it out, man. It's it's. They said actually that's, it's probably the best underground street ball mixtape ever in history they can't you know the freestyles are sick it's just it's totally different than and one like it's similar but it's like a different it's just totally different the moves are different and it's crazy okay so where does this take you, you where, where do you end up going what what uh what parts of the world do you get to see from this okay so yeah so i traveled uh went to new york um i end up actually doing a lot of stuff with and one uh, I, I played with the, in the Ball for Real tour with An One. I did the An One mixtape season uh, tour tour two as well. I played some side games, so I was all over the United States. Took me to Japan, um, and then all of a sudden, kind of like, yeah, I took me to China too as well. China, uh, all through Europe, like I traveled everywhere, man. Germany, a lot of places, man. What was the what was the most unique place you went to? Oh man, I think uh, definitely, definitely Japan. Japan. What was, what was unique about it? I don't think people understand the street ball, but out there, those guys could play street ball. Like street ball is 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 big out there because we actually sold the Nautic tape out in in, in uh, DVD actually because we came out the tape, but after that, later on, we came with the DVD. We sold out there. And it got sold out in about an hour and a half, sold out. And we're like, what the heck? Like, so that was so unique because you never think that people in Japan will watch watch street ball, but it's super popular, super popular. When I went out there the first time, I couldn't believe how many people love street ball out there. It was crazy. Yeah, well, that, that's the thing about basketball, right? Like, you know, we've got a unique situation in the world right now where, you know, we got it where, you know, people are dealing with racism, you're dealing with this, you're dealing with that. But at the end of the day, in basketball, at the end of the day, you can either play or you can't. It, it's, it's true. It's and, true. And if you can play, everybody loves it. At the end of the day, if you can play, you, you're going to, they don't care in Japan. The Japan don't care. They just no, want to can this guy play? And, yeah. And the answer was yes. Yes. And these other guys play. The answer was yes. So nothing else really matters to them. And just like, you know, I think deep down, that's what it's supposed to be like. But anyway, so you go there, the stuff sells out. The yeah. world is, you know, if, if you, if it's got to be coming at you hundred miles an hour. You got to be like, what the heck's going on right now? But I didn't understand it. I really didn't understand it because being at that age, like he's so young, 19, 20, 21, it's like, man, like, I didn't understand what was going on. Like, yeah, I just ran by, but I never thought anything business-wise what that would do. 
right? Business wise, I just want to play ball, you know? So yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. So now you come back to Vancouver. What brings yeah. you back to Vancouver and then what happened? Well, I was, I was in and out. I, I was in and out. So I never, I never lived there. I was just in and out. Right. So during that, so I was doing that from the age of like traveling the world when I was not, not when I was 18 to about 22, 23 going to all these different places. How did it happen? Howard Kelsey. So I used to play, I used to play at Kids Beach a lot. Howard saw me play. Howard Kelsey saw me play. It's like, yo, actually, no, before that, because I used to, I, I, I met Howard. I saw, I remember playing against Howard. The first time I saw Howard was actually a Dunbar three on three tournament or four on four full court or three on three uh, full court at Dunbar Community Center. That was really popular during that time. But I only played one, one year. And I'm like, and I was killing, killing. So I remember the game. And I, I, I remember this game to this day. It's like, so we won the first game, second game. Because I was playing with Michael Dickinson's cousin. Right, and he, he used to live up here, and he used to lives up here, so he invited me to play. So he's so we were one first and second game, and I remember the game saying, "Yo, we're playing against Canadian national team player. We're playing against Randy North and Howard Kelsey, and and they had a few other guys too." I was like, it lit up my head. What we're playing against? Okay, I want to give those guys a business. That's in my head the whole time, you know. <laughs> so all of a sudden, I'm going at Randy. And I was like, I think I was like 20, 21. I'm going at Randy hard. And we're battling back and forth, battling. He's talking trash. I'm talking trash. And then you got this guy, tall, six, four, six, five. I think he's even tall, six, six. You know, older guy, but stroking it and talking smack. So I was like, hold up. This guy's actually not that bad, but he's talking smack, though. So we're going at it. We ended up losing by like a few points, but it was a close game. And and that's what the first time I met Howard. Then I played at Kids Beach. And I was doing my thing at Kids Beach, and Howard approached me. Hey, what's going on? How you doing? This is my Howard Kessie. He's putting a national team. I think you have a lot of talent. And I think you have a lot of talent. I think you I think you, you can play on the Canada national team, Canadian national team. I was like, yeah, right. Yeah, you don't want to be serious. You got a great handle, like this and that. Like, you could play. I'm like, ah, okay. Because during the time, I never had anybody actually give me that, how could I say? What's the word? That praise. Never praise me saying like you're you're, you know what I mean? Like you have, like you you could play in the NBA or you could do that. So I never really thought about it. I was like, whatever, like, you know, I've been so because it, it was hard for me, right? It was really hard for me. I never really had that much people believe in my they believe in my top talent. But they never really fully believed in me. So hearing that from Howard actually meant a lot. But so during that time, I was on tour too as well. I got invited to go play on tour with Ball for Real, which was the N1 guys. So they made a big split, right? So they started their own tour. So I had a contract for 100. So I'm on tour and I had an opportunity to go in $100,000 because it was during a competition during that time. So Howard contacts Canada basketball during that time. And, 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 and mentions my name and says, hey, Joey, you know, got this player. He's really good. He's really fast. He has a great handle. Trust me, this kid is, you, you need to have this kid on your team. And so Leah Rountons sends me an email, right, saying, you know, I heard how talked highly about you and we want to bring you to a, 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 the ID camp. We'll fly you out to Toronto. Wherever you're at, I know you're on tour. Wherever you're at, we'll fly you out. I'll let my assistant contact you. So assistant contact me. We're, we're, uh, we're, we're talking details, where to, where to fly me out, where I'm, where's going to be my next stop so they can fly me out to try for the team. So I'm thinking in my head, okay, should I go for Canada basketball? I'm thinking Canada basketball could lead me to go to maybe to the NBA, get some look overseas, get some, you know what I mean? Legitimacy. Or should I, should I go for the hundred thousand dollars? Cause I'm right there. I, I got, I got 15 games on my belt. I'm in favor to win. I have everything. I like, I get a hundred thousand dollars at age of 20, hearing that at age of 22, 23, hundred thousand dollars in your pocket. 
So I didn't take the flight. I did not take the flight. Leo Rout sends me an email. Says, oh, we're, uh, the guys are waiting for you and you never showed up. It was the nastiest email ever. The nastiest email. Howard got upset too. He called, I called Howard like, listen, man, I'm so upset. You could have made that team. I'm like, yo, Howard, I'm sorry. You know, it just, you know, I, I, I'm going for, I know, I understand, but guess what? I put, I, I put a lot on the line for you. And I, and I vouch for you. And now, you know, you, he didn't say like, you made, you made me look bad, but you know what I mean? Like I just had a lot of, I think you could have made the team. I really think you could have made the team. So check this out. This is a crazy story right here. That same year, right after that, when I didn't go, then when they made the team, guess who was the first exhibition game they played against? Who? USA. That's terrible. I'm on the I'm on I'm on the uh, I'm on the um, I'm on the tour bus watching Canada play USA. And know what's going on in my head? What's going on? What if? What if? Hundred percent. I would be playing against Dwayne Wade, LeBron James. You already know the rest. USA team. Yeah. I was going on in my head, man. Yeah. Oh yeah, that'll mess with you. So yeah, so that's 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 how I met Howard. That's how it met. So what Howard happened did. after that? So after that, I met my wife. I met my wife that time. She's a school teacher. And she's like, listen, street ball is cool. But what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do with your life after that? Like if something you ain't gonna play street ball's not really street ball. Like you're not you're not gonna make a living off it, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I had a friend that wanted me to go to Halifax to play in an all-black tournament that's, that's really known down there. He told me to come one year. He's like, yo, Joey, go down there. Go to this all-black tournament. You got to go. You got to go. I'm like, man, what a, Halifax? Like, why would I go to Halifax? I don't know nothing about Halifax. Like, why? He's like, trust me, Joey. The ball there is good. There's a lot of schools out there. Um, that, that look for players, this would be a great opportunity for you. I didn't go. Second year, he's like, listen, I'm going to buy you a ticket, man. I'm going to buy you a ticket to take send you. I'm like, man, you know what? He ended up buying me a ticket, and he actually forced me to go out there. I actually ended up going out there. We go pay, pick up at St. Mary's University, okay? I go to St. Mary's University. And I play in an open gym. And I cross the guy up, and he almost fell. And we end up winning like three games in a row. But when, the, when I did that, after that first game, I'm about to go to the washroom. I see the assistant coach, Jonah, Jonah Tassi. He's a, right now the head coach of St. Mary's. Run down from the bleachers and say, hey, we're looking for a point guard, man. And you could be our point guard. We give you a scholarship right now. I'm like, come on, man. I went to the bathroom. I'm like, come on, I ain't going to believe you, man. <laughs> so I go to the men's bathroom, man. You know when I come out? He's waiting outside the bathroom. I'm like, come on. Yeah, seriously, like, we want you right now. We're missing our point guard. We're losing him this. He's gone, right? We need somebody. Whatever. So I continue playing in the tournament. We end up coming third. I ended up doing really well in that tournament. I had a lot of schools wanted me. Kate Breton wanted me. Uh, PEI uh, in St. Mary's, right? And the head coach of St. Mary's came to watch me play, and I had a meeting with him. He's like, yeah, da-da-da. Like, we're talking about, talking about the school, talking about, you know, my transcripts, about grades. <laughs> and, uh, and I told him, and he didn't think he want like, he wanted me to be on the team, but that I didn't really have the proper grades, right? So he's like, listen, think about it, you know, think about it. And, you know, when you get back, you know, we really want you, but you got to fix your grades. You might have to go to college or something like that to get your, your grades right. But he didn't know too much about me. So I end up going back. And during that time, I knew my wife. I bumped into my wife. It's crazy how things work. And so I'm in the beach and I'm talking to how we're talking. I'm playing ball. And I, sit, I remember sitting on the bench 
and how shit was going on. So what are you going to do? I'm like, you know, Howard, I'm really sorry. I apologize. I'm really sorry about it, man. I, I don't know what my head was. I feel bad. <clears throat> then all of a sudden, he's like, so I'm like, but I have the school name St. Mary's. I want to see. He's like, St. Mary's? It's like, who's a, you mean, who's a St. Mary's University? I'm like, yeah, yeah. He's like, wait, who coaches St. Mary's? A guy named Ross Quack. He's like, what? Ross Quackenbush? Man, I know Ross Quackenbush. I used to play in the same national team as him. What the heck are you talking about? He's like, man, I need to give him a call right now. He called me, called me Ross Quackenbush. I got a call like in hours or the next day. Listen, they offered you a scholarship, right? They're going to get you into the school because now, because when I went to school, they called, I'm like, a, okay, because I haven't been to school in a while. I'm be like a, like an adult student or something like that. There's a, I don't know. Because I, I didn't go to school after I dropped out at 18. I didn't go to school the four or five years. Oh, I'm a mature student. That's what it was. Yeah, mature. Yeah, mature student. So I ended up going there, man, to St. Mary's University through that connection, right? Because I was a mature student. But during the time I was talking to Ross, he didn't really know my, know my history of my school. Like he did. I didn't have the proper grades, but he didn't know I was a mature student. I can get it. So he looked into it. Boom. Got into St. Mary's University from there. And so what was that like? So so obviously it didn't go well the first time in, in community college at Lane Garrett. Yeah. Do you go in with a little more focus on your academics to try to pass oh, the classes? Man, I was – wake up in the morning. When I heard, when he told me, listen, you need to have a C point – you need to get a, have a grade point average of, of a C or C plus to, to, to stay on the team, right? If you don't – when I heard that, if you don't, you fail out, you can't play ball. I'm like, it's my chance right now. And he's like, listen, I'll let you play your game, man. I'll let you play your game. You can do your thing, just less dribbling. And I'll teach you, teach you how to play. Like, I'll teach you the fundamentals. Cool. If you could let me play my game and tweak some things, that's great. I studied my butt off. More, I get up, eat while I'm eating my breakfast, I'm studying. Go to school, got my classes, out of school, I'm studying my breaks. Studying in every break, every break I'm studying, studying. At nighttime, I'm studying. Didn't go out no, 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 nowhere. Friends ask me, let's go, let's go to, to the bar, let's go to the, 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 the club. Didn't go anywhere at all, nothing. The first semester, I got a B average, man. B, B average, because I just dedicated myself. It wasn't easy. No. Man, I remember, man, having stacks of papers, man. Stacks of papers. Because I, I had a hard time retaining information in my head. So I was like, okay, I'm not super good with this. I'm a visual learner. I'm just going to write down everything. This for, for me to remember, I'm just writing everything down. And it was stacks of paper, stacks of paper just to memorize, man. I get paper from the, the student lounge, wherever, just writing, writing, writing. If I run out, I go get a notepad or something. I just, just because that's what I had to do. That's what I had to do, right? And I actually get, end up getting better and end up remembering things a little bit better because I just had to work hard. I'm not, everyone learns different, right? Everyone learns different. And then after that, I actually became, the first year I played there, I was leading score at uh, each year. For three years I played there, uh, got all-star, um, and actually my last year playing, I was the leading scorer in the nation, having 28.9 points per game, right? So I worked not on my schoolwork, but also just as hard, because I saw like this, I was like, if I'm going to work hard on my, on my schoolwork for three, four hours, I'm going to work hard on my game for three, four hours too. That, that's the dedication that I had. Three, four hours of homework, three, four hours I'm going to work on my game. So yeah, that's, what, that, that's my college career. You know what, man? I, I what I like about that story is the message of work. You have to put in the work. Yeah, uh, you can have all the talent you want. It doesn't matter. You know, yeah. you, you were talented when you were at Lancaster, but you didn't put in the yeah. work. Now you say yeah. to yourself, "Listen." Again, the pressure. You know, I think what it is for you is is when somebody puts some pressure on you, you actually take the challenge, right? Yeah. And yes. so. That from the stories I've been hearing today, that's that's a big theme for you. Is you need a, you need somebody to put a little pressure on you to challenge you, and then your yeah. game rises to the next level. So you played yeah. three years. What happened there? So three years there. Um, after that, uh, I had one more year to go back to that school. Um, 
at St. Mary's and uh, actually my, I had my first son, Javon, uh, in 2010. And uh, it was Ross Quackenbush last year. So he really wanted me to go back, go back to school for his last year, especially, you know, knowing he's not going to be there. So one more ride. I really want to go back. But at the same time, I had my young one. I needed money. So I ended up turning, turning, turning pro after that. So I played in the NBL Canada for, uh, for three years. So my first year, uh, we made it to the finals the first year. Uh, I was uh, Canadian Player of the Year that year, uh, two, two years in a row, playing pro. Uh, and then after that, uh, I went to Denmark for, for a year. I was the leading scorer in Denmark um, and uh, running out for MVP. And then uh, I, had, I had an opportunity to go back again uh, to Denmark, but the pay wasn't a whole lot. You know, so and I'm going back again to uh, where did I go after that? I went to Iceland for about say three weeks to a month. Didn't really like it a whole lot. Um, you know, it was really tough being out there. Uh, we had like one practice, one practice a day. If I wanted to shoot around and work on my game, they had other schools using the facility and other people. So they only had 30 minutes of open gym during the day and practices were six, eight, six o'clock only for an hour, hour and a half. So imagine I'm waking up. I don't know anybody. I'm in a fish town. Right. And I got to get up and I got to wait. I got to go to a gym for 30 minutes to work on my game. I go to a little weight room. That's like super small to lift weights. It just wasn't, it wasn't, it didn't pan out. Going from Denmark to Iceland was, you know, it was like a drop down because I thought I would have a better contract after Denmark, but it is what it is. And uh, so I left there and I went back to the NBL that year and he ended, went up going to the finals again. And um, and then what happened after that? And after I took a year off of ball and I went back to the NBL again for the Halifax uh, Hurricanes because they changed names uh, back to the Raymond again. And um, yeah, I played pro for six years and that's my pro career, man. I love it. So, you know, now where everybody knows you is on the internet, you, you got a pretty solid following on the internet. Um, yeah. did, did something happen before you got started with that in the meantime between you playing pro and that or, or what, or did it slide right into that? Oh man. Um, I think I, it was after actually Denmark, after Denmark, um, I actually, um, so I got Instagram. I, I, it was kind of new to me, right? I saw quite a few guys like that I used to play street ball with and against on Instagram, like Professor and like a guy named Pat the Rock on there posting a lot of footage. So when I got back from Denmark, I said, hey, let me just mess with this thing, see, see what, what it's all about. So I remember this dribbling combination I was doing and actually, you know, got a lot of hits, a lot of follows, and I kind of just started from there again. And I was still posting stuff too as well, like my pro career. But when I actually went to Japan, um, that was the, yeah, with Japan like four or five years ago. Um, I got invited for a streetball exhibition. And I, I didn't, my last time I went to Japan was in 2000, when I was 2004, 2000, no, 2007 was the last time. So I got invited out like four, three, four years ago to go out there and, I fell in love with streetball again, man. I played in a three-on-three -three tournament called Sum City, which is a kind of a streetball league. And uh, um, and I ended up doing really well. And the crowd was just, I just remember the crowd was going crazy, 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 man. Yelling my name and stuff. I was like, you know what, man? I think streetball is where I need to be at in my life, you know? And so I kind of, you know, pushed the uh, pro stuff to the side for a little bit and just kind of focus on, you know, on the ball handling and um, doing a lot of street ball stuff and, you know, teaching the kids how to, you know, how to handle the rock. So that's where it all started for me. Well, Hunter, you got, I just, while you were talking, I looked it up. You got 171,000 followers on Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> you got. That's all organic too, man. That's no <laughs> paid, paid followers. Those are all organic, man. You got 11,000 subscribers, which is a lot of subscribers on, on YouTube. Yeah, YouTube is picking up too as well. Oh, so that's you start putting these one on ones. You're messing people up on one on one, and you're throwing, <laughs> you're throwing it up on the YouTube. What? So how now? Let's be serious here. Your content's actually very, very. As somebody who is on the internet a little too much, your content's very good. It's not like you're just throwing this stuff up there. You have somebody that helps you put it up there. What's the whole? Nope. You, you nope. do it yourself. Everything's me, man. Everything's me. I, I do my Instagram. I do my YouTube. And actually, I was doing YouTube 
for 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 about four or five years ago just to try to find what really works. I do some re like do some stuff, put some stuff out, not a lot of followers and stuff like that. Until kind of recently, I put this thing called streetball beef recently. And and it's just me going play ball and it's just basketball. Like guys arguing for arguing with calls for calls. That's that that's out of bounds. Me messing somebody up and and I put it out there and actually I was like and it got, got a lot of views. It was probably my best video. I got for my other videos because before I was just putting out just one on one. Me, I'll play a guy one on one. That's it. But it wasn't a story behind it, right? It wasn't really interactive. So, yeah, man, I, I it's all trial and error, man. It's all trial and error. So now, right now, I kind of know what people want to see. People want to see ball, ball, so they want to see have a little story behind it. So, I, and so. A lot of the recent stuff I'm gonna call street ball beef because it's not beef like getting mad at body, but the stuff that happens during playing rec ball or playing one on one, right? Like people need to see that type type of stuff, especially you know what too for Vancouver, because Vancouver has a lot of great basketball players, but we don't get the love. Like we don't get a whole lot of love, man. So I think I have, I feel I have a responsibility with all the falls I have to put try to try my best to put Vancouver on the map wherever I whatever I do whatever I do because Toronto has a it does great but I think the city people need to see how people are on the basketball court how people interact because it's so it's so close people don't want to don't know what happens here with basketball Right, especially when you're playing one on one, two on two, three on three, four on four, right? Because they might think we're maybe too nice or something like that. I don't know, right? But they need to see that we can compete, that we can play at the next level too, as well. So I hope that helps uh, the basketball here in the city too, as well. But also people see that around the world, and hopefully bring the Vancouver Grizzlies back and and show interest. I, I, I did, that's just one little piece. There's other 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 little pieces with that too, as well, right? But I hope that kind of spark something for sure so who films for you so you do the editing who's actually filming oh i got it i got it sometimes to be honest with you sometimes i get people people to who's watching hey man can you film this film this right now man for me man sometimes man yeah but usually oh. i get guys that i train i got this guy named andy uh he's uh he actually it's so funny because i started adult training and he came to train and but also he does a lot of uh, Chinese like social media. So he helps my channel social media. So he got a camera guy to come film my games and stuff like that. So it's just through through some through him that he, he comes out and films. Sometimes we use our my 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 phone. So it's not some big 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 film crew. It's just through my through my iPhone. Well, I, I think the thing that makes you special on on in the social media aspect is your consistency. You got it's a lot. Of, you're you're constantly putting out content. I think from a from a business standpoint, uh, as a business owner, I see you putting out a lot of content and I appreciate the hustle on that level because I think it's important. You gotta, you gotta keep producing. And one thing you said that's important, you know, it's like that story of hammering away at the rock, right? You hammer, 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 you do it a hundred times, it doesn't break and then 101, it, it snaps. And it's like, it, it wasn't 101, it was all the ones you did before that. And yeah. so same thing with you, like you didn't start at 170,000 followers, you started at one and then it just kinda, as exactly. you producing content. So we're going to do a little bit of rapid fire questions. When, yeah. when who's the best leader that you've been around? The best leader. Oof. I know what it is. Is my, my parents, man, my parents, my brother, my dad, my dad's worked hard, really hard for, you know, since coming in this country, it wasn't easy for him. You know, a lot of racism during that time in the seventies when a lot of black people here. Right. So, you know, he had to fight for, for, for his position, especially his job. Right. So, to feed us, so it wasn't easy. So watching my dad go to work daily, sometimes I won't even see him like for a whole day because he does like two to three shifts at the Port of Vancouver during that time. So it was tough, man. It's tough. Tough. It was tough. We had some tough times, but you know, I think him, him, see, by seeing him actually made me who I am today. Uh, my mom, especially my mom, and my brother too, as well. But my dad is definitely a major, major part of my life. Sure. One of the things I like to ask, who, who, who taught you your work ethic? So you'd say your, your parents, watching your parents hustle. With oh, just watch. And they never, I could tell you straight up, they never really talk, like, to me, say, hey, this is what you got to do. They kind of show by action, you know what I mean? 
I guess because they, 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 at the end of the day, they worked so hard. They, they, I felt like, for such my dad, he worked so hard when he came home. He's tired. He's falling. I remember him falling asleep on the ground, right? Like with his keys and like with all his work clothes. So when I saw that, it's like, man, like, you know what I mean? So he never really had a time. I, like he never really sat down with me and actually t- I was, and told me how to, I should live my life. Tell me how to, sh- I should live my life and what I should do. I just saw what he did. That's huge. And so um, when you were growing up, what did you want to do? Oh, man, basketball. Basketball player. Yeah, man. NBA, NBA, NBA. Um, what's, what's your next challenge? What are you trying to work at right now to take it to the next level? Oh, man. Uh, so I started my uh, actually basketball academy called School of Handles last year. And I uh, started out at Burn High School. And now uh, it's been a year now. And now we uh, collaborated with a company uh, called Game Ready. Uh, which is uh, in North Van. So we collaborated with them. They were doing the strength and conditioning training. And we were doing a lot of basketball stuff uh, out in that gym. And uh, we just got Langley Event Center every Sundays, running, uh, running, running a lot of basketball camps. And r- right now we're just using various gyms to, um, to, do, to do train kits. So it's, it's growing after a year. And we, we're doing a, we've been doing a lot of training outdoors during, during the pandemic on Empire Field. And we've been getting a lot of kids. So um, just teaching a lot of ball handling, teaching how to play the game. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's been going great, especially having getting a Langley Event Center was huge, which was huge. You were talking about how, you know, Howard was the first guy that was a player that kind of gave you the belief that you could do stuff. Yeah. Who was the first coach that gave you the belief that you were actually – you you had it? Uh, uh, I say Mel Davis, Trick Davis. He used to be uh, – he used to coach, uh, coach, uh, coach me when I was in uh, – my 12, 11 years old, and he used to tell me some things uh, back in the day. Uh, he saw me. He saw a lot of glimpses of uh, Isaiah Thomas in my game a little bit. So by me hearing that from him, it actually gave me uh, gave me a lot of confidence. Who's the best player you ever played against? Oh man, Whew. man, there's a there's a lot, man. There's a lot, especially playing in the NBL Canada. There's a lot. Um, played guys that played against was Jamal Crawford, uh, Eric Gordon. He was tough. Another street ball guy that's really good is uh named Exile Young, Roberto Exile Young. He's on um, street ball and one mixtape. He's a tough player. Um, yeah, those are the guys I think were the toughest guys I played against. So let me ask you this question: If I'm a ten, if I'm in grade nine and I want to have a, a, a legitimately fantastic handle, how how much time do I got to spend every day to to get my handle right? First, you got to love it. You got to love doing it. Secondly, you got to be, you got to be kind of creative. You got to be creative with the ball. Yeah, it's good to do drills, right? But you got to be, have a career. You have to be creative. The third thing you want to be is you want to be one with the basketball. You want to be able to move with that basketball. So when you're dribbling, don't be stiff. I want to connect with that basketball. It's like dancing. Dancing with the stars, right? Dancing with your girlfriend, going to a nightclub. Like, you want to have that connection. So don't let the basketball control, control you. You control the basketball, but have it, in, have it in, in a way that you're connecting with it. See, that's what ball handling is all about. So if I was a kid, I would take, I would, I would take that ball with me everywhere I go. Corner store, dribbling. I go to go to the grocery store. I, I'm dribbling while I'm walking. Somewhere I'm dribbling. You, you have to have it, that ball has to be extension of your body. So that's how you become a good ball handler. So, you know, I've noticed you're not just a hand. I mean, I, you know, I watch your game, but obviously your name's King Handle. But, you know, you see me, you got some legit hurt. You got uh, your shots actually technically just about flawless. <laughs> what, what, when did you transform the just the handle part of your game to add the, the shooting and the jumping and, and that sort of thing? Yeah, that's a good. That's a good question, man. When everybody started to back off me, I had to learn how to shoot. <laughs> when they didn't, they didn't want to get broke or look embarrassed. I had, I had to develop a shot. So I remember one summer I didn't do no street ball tricks. I just worked on my mid range. That's all I used to do: fifteen footers, fifteen footers, fifteen foot. That's all I do for man for hours. And I would do the same thing over and over and over and over again. And when I used to get comfortable with it, okay, I was like, okay, I'm, th- I'm thinking. If an NBA, NBA player on an elite player is guarding me, 
how am I going to get my shot off? I can't, I can't, I can't get my shot off. Like, this is too slow. I got to make my shot quicker. Because the higher level you play, the more athletic guys are. So you can't have the same shot in high school or elementary and think you can get away at the pros. You got to kind of have a quick release. You have to try to get that ball in your shooting pocket as quick as you can. You got a high pocket too. Yes. High pocket, low pocket. You got to change your pockets, right? So you have to have different arsenal when you get to that elite because everyone's good. Everyone at the pro level, everybody can play. At a college, college level, everybody can play. So what are you going to bring different? So that's why I thought, so, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to dribble here. I'm getting my shooter pocket here. I'm going to catch it here, release there, right? I'm going to, as soon as I get that ball uh, from the wing, I'm going to catch it with one hand right away and bring it up. Oh, I'm not going to catch it with two hands because if I catch it with two hands, yeah, some, I can get away with it, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking in my head, if Michael Jordan's guarding me, if Allen Iverson's guarding me, how am I going to get the shot up quicker? So that's all I was thinking in my head the whole time to get my shot. No, it's huge. And, and you know what I think? Um... You know, part of the problem is we have ADD as a society now. I know when I was in high school, I had ADD, DD. Yeah. Five D's. I was. Just, oh, really? <laughs> I, you... hey, we didn't have it back then. There was no such thing as ADD. Well, but that's a new thing. But I, I, looking back, it's like, oh wait, I was learning disability for sure. There's no chance I, I wasn't. They just we didn't have it. It wasn't a thing. There wasn't a learning disability. But yeah. you know, I hope I hope people watch to the end of this because I think some of the things you said can really change people's lives, and I think the impact. Mm-hmm. It's huge. And I think the thing I like about your story is that it wasn't easy. No. You know, um, no. you had to grind. You had to put in the work. You had to keep working. It might not have come right away. You had some regret. You learn from the regret. You know, yeah. like there's a whole bunch of stuff there. If you go back in time and give a young Joey some, some tips, what, what, are you, what are you telling grade eight Joey right now? Man, grade eight. Working. Keep working, keep working, keep believing in yourself. That's what I tell myself. That's what I tell myself. I don't think I would change anything. I would never change anything. I always tell him, keep working. He'll figure it out. The young Joe, you'll figure out. Because I did. <laughs> I love that. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, man. It, uh, it, for me personally, I appreciate it. I just, you know, for me, I like watching guys and girls who appreciate their craft, whatever the craft is, and and are willing to put in the work to take it to the next level. Because I think I can learn from anybody who is willing to put in the work and and watching your consistency. You know, like we like it's not like we talk all like we've never we talked one time, I think. You know, yeah. I, I think I, I saw you at the at the Kids Fest and I said, I just wanted to say, hey, we, we love your stuff. But yeah. you know, from from a distance, I appreciate your consistency, your work ethic. I appreciate uh, the fun you have with the game because I think, you know, one of the things you said, your ball's got to be part of you and you got to you gotta love it. And yeah. I think that's noticeable. You know, you have an infectious uh, uh, attitude about you to the game and, and happiness of playing the game, which I think a lot of people forget the game's supposed to be fun. And so yes. that, that's cool for me to watch. And I want to say thank you so much for, uh, for coming on today and for sharing your story, man. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Great, man. I just hope somebody, you know, kids out there, you know, learn from my, uh, from my, from my past and just work hard. You know, sky's the limit, no matter where you're from, Vancouver, they think you can't make the NBA, man, go ahead, work hard, man, work hard. I think, I, I, and I think that's our next goal as, as, as me being a coach and, and, and everybody else is being a coach. We got to develop the next, the next NBA player. Who's going to be the next Steve Nash. It's going to be a lot of work, right? Well, we got yeah. Kelly, you know, and, and, you know, like you look at Kelly Olenek, right? Like, um, oh, yeah. I don't know Kelly, I, but I got to interview his dad the other day. But, you know, the thing about Kelly is, you know, um, he, he was obviously a star in high school for sure. I mean, oh, amazing. But, amazing. but, you know, he went down to Gonzaga and people forget, man, he sat his ass on a bench and he was a nobody. And, and then he had to redshirt season. And he had to work his ass off for an entire year without any games. That's crazy. Without any reward, without nothing. It was just him in the gym. And um, he went from redshirting one year later to being in the NBA as a lottery pick. 
I mean, you, you know, obviously not all of us are as tall as Kelly or as, you know, you know, natural. Yeah. And he's definitely got a bunch of natural gifts to him, but you don't go from nobody on the bench to, to, oh. you know, I got it. We, in our office, we have Sports Illustrated. Um, I, I was collecting Sports Illustrated since I was like in grade six. Yeah. Um, I got Kelly Olenek Sports Illustrated on the front page of Sports Illustrated in my hallway at the office. It's That's just great. Kind of, put it up right and to go from a nobody to on the hallway sports illustrated that's a big deal man and it's cool to watch him in the nba finals now what though you know oh he, is, is he still with miami what, what team is he playing oh, for? Miami, yeah he's there he just made the final last night so check this out for with kelly he went from guard playing guard in high school going to gonzaga and developing his post game Going to the NBA and playing like a like a stretch what stretch stretch five four stretch four yeah that's crazy going going from guard playing guard all his high school all his high school career maybe even elementary to doing that that's amazing how that switch over that switch because you knew okay listen I'm probably not quick enough or whatever let me adjust well all the skills that he had as a guard as a guard he wasn't good enough because he, yeah. he wasn't he wasn't fast enough. He didn't have uh, the puck. But as a post player, well, now all of a sudden, he's fast for a post player. He's, <laughs> he can stretch the floor because he's shooting. He shot like 45% or something from the three this year, which is a, an insane number. And then, and then he's got a great IQ for a, for a big guy because he, he used to be a point guard. So all yeah. the things that, you know, it's funny because if you don't have one thing, sometimes you got something else and you don't even know it. You don't even know it. You don't even know it, right? It's crazy. And I th and, and see, that's one of many. You know, so there's so many basketball players that play in the NBA here, man. There's so many. We just have to, you know, I don't know. We got we got a lot of work to do. We well, got to keep running, like you said. Just keep working, right? So yeah. we'll leave it at that. Thanks so much, Joe. I really appreciate it. Thank you.